Pimienta with Pimienta Realty. Uh, today I'm going to show you guys how to create a listing agreement for a rental property. So I'm going to pull up a mock um, property, I would say, um, and then we're going to build a listing agreement for a rental listing based on that way. So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to come here to our form simplicity, which I already have pulled up. And we're just going to do a search for listing. When this pulls up, then we're going to go to, there's a whole series of options here. We're doing a listing agreement for rental. So we're going to do exclusive right to list. So I'm sorry, to lease listing agreement. We're going to click on that. Then it's going to give us our screen here. And this is what our listing agreement looks like. Not a lot of pages, pretty basic. Um, and then we're gonna start off with the broker. I like to fill in the things that I already know. Um, in this case, it's gonna be Pimienta Realty, LLC. Um, and then we're gonna find our owner's name. So how we do that? We're going to go to, I already have my MLS pulled up. We're gonna go to the MLS. We're going to do Miami Gateway, which is how we log in. And I have already done that. So I'm going to skip to that step, which should be here. Once you get to that, you're going to see this screen with all of these options here. I like to go to the option for IMAP and you can, you can get IMAP one of two ways. You can get IMAP on this screen right here, or you can get IMAP on the next screen, which I'm going to show you by going into the actual MLS and I click on that and it's going to take us to the next screen. And then here you're going to have a series of things. As you can see on the left hand side, you're going to have external links with the same links that you would have on the first page that I showed you with the bigger icons. Yet this one is going to have IMAP, and here you can also access form simplicity from here. But in this case, for purpose of this example, we're going to go straight to IMAP. Here, we're going to do a search for our property. This case, we have to make sure and always verify what county your property is in. In our case, the property that we're going to use as an example will be in Miami-Dade. And we're going to put this property address. In this case, we're going to use property that I know. So this is the property address. Then we're going to go to start search. We're going to have pulled up all the information of the person. In this case, just to give you guys a little history, this is a house that I own that I inherited. So it's still in my grandma's name, still going through probate, but we're just going to use it for example. In this case, this person is going to be Violeta Bonet, um, the owner. So this is where you would find the current owner's name. Here's where you would find the property address, tax ID, tax mailing address. We don't want to use the tax mailing address because the tax mailing address is for purposes of mail. mail. So let's say this person was going to be is a foreign investor and they own several properties. They may have it under an LLC and they may receive their mail there. We don't want to put the tax mailing address on our listing agreement because that is not the property that we're going to be leasing. We want to make sure that we're putting the property address to the property that we'll be leasing or selling on that contract. So we're going to start with the person's name. This case is Violeta Bonet. I'm going to type it in because it's I don't want to copy and paste it, but you are more than welcome to copy and paste. We're going to go back to this and we're going to type in the person's name. As far as your time frame, it all depends on what you like to do. I like to put six months, but it all depends on the client and how many months they want to have you list their property on the market. We're going to start with February 22nd, which is today's day. And we're going to end it on, let's see, March, April, May, June, July, August. So we're going to say this is going to run all the way through August, which will be your six months. But again, this is whatever agreement you have with your client. Everything is going to be, it's going to vary by person. These are just examples. I do mine for six months. Some people may do one year. Some people may do three months. It all depends. Then we want to go to the property address. If you know the property address, you can type it there. And if you don't, then you're going to come right back over here. And where it says property address, we're just going to simply copy and paste. And there we go. Legal description. We're going to go back to IMAP. 
We're going to see where it says legal description, copy and paste that in there as well. I'm going to go back I'm going to copy and paste it. Now we got to go through personal property, including appliances. What appliances are going to be included with the rental? Many cases it's going to be your stove, your refrigerator, your microwave, um, your dishwasher, washers and dryers. Um, there's exceptions to all of these rules. Sometimes people bring in their own washers. Sometimes people bring in their own um, equipment, in other words. And you, that's something that you have to discuss with your clients. In my case, the property is going to have a stove. So we would like to put electric. Ooh, electric. Range. Or, um, we do say refrigerator. I think I spelled it right. Might be spelled wrong, guys. I apologize. Uh, dishwasher. Some places don't have dishwashers. Uh, we want to say washer dryer. And microwave. So far, that's basic appliances that you would find in houses. Again, this all varies from rental to rental, property to property. Then we're going to move down occupancy property. I'm, yes, the occupancy of the property. Is it currently occupied? Is it currently occupied by the landlord or the tenant? And if there is a tenant in place, when does that lease expire? In this case, uh, we're just going to say for purposes of this example, the property is not currently occupied. Um, then we're going to move on to the rent and rate, rental and terms. So the rental period and rate, it's going to vary. Some people want to put here yearly, monthly, weekly. This is one or seasonal, depends on what type of rental you have. Um, we're going to focus on a regular basic rental that's going to run for a whole year. And we're going to say here that the month, the monthly rent is going to be 2,500 and it's going to be paid on a monthly basis. Then we want to go on to the next part, which talks about advanced rents, deposits, and fees. This basically is going to tell you how is that deposit going to be held. We don't hold any escrow, at least in my firm. And unless you're running a property management company, I don't see why you need to hold any money in any account for any owner. So in this case, we are going to say that the money is going to be held by the owner. Is it going to be in a non-interest bearing account? Is it going to be in an interest bearing escrow account where the tenant is going to receive 5% per year on any balances that, in, that, that will incur? Um, this is stuff that you need to discuss with your client. Only your client can tell you what you're going to be clicking here because everyone has to sign it. You will sign it and the, set, and the, and the landlord will be signing it as well. So you got to go over this with your client. Interest bearing escrow accounts, tenants will receive whatever amount of interest rate that is annualized on an average a year. Um, and then this would also have to apply any balance of interest will incur to who's going to be keeping that interest. Will it be the owner or will it be the broker? In my case, since we're talking about a listing that's going to my brokerage, I am not keeping anybody's interest. We do not hold escrow, so this does not apply to the brokerage, to this brokerage. But if you're watching this video and you are from another brokerage, then you would have to discuss this with your broker as well as with your clients to see which one is going to be the one that works for them. Um, we're going to move on. And so it's going to talk about advanced rents. Again, this is something that you need to discuss with your clients. Are they going to be getting first, last and security? If they're going to be receiving first, last and security, then we're just going to put here 2500 or whatever that amount may be for your last month or any advance rent that's going to be collected under security deposit again how much security deposit does your client want to hold in the account uh, in case there's any damages in the property once the tenant moves out so that's going to be another 2500 for purposes of my example will there be pets allowed now again have the conversation with your client will your client allow pets if they are, are they going to be charging a pet deposit? If so, is that deposit going to be refundable or is it going to be non-refundable? I like to do non-refundables and I like to do 500 per pet. Um, that's just my preference. Again, it's up to you guys what you guys want to do with your clients. As far as a credit report fee, 
At Pimienta Realty, we do have an application fee. That application is $75, and I run credit, backgrounds, and eviction history. Um, I'll ask my agents to use this website, which we can get to in a different video, um, to run backgrounds, credit, and evictions for clients so that they don't waste any time and they can offer this service to the, to the person that's going to be renting the property. You don't want to have client, you don't want to have an angry client who says that you brought them a tenant that was not qualified enough. My advice is run your own reports, whether you use the system, whether you don't, whether you have another system that you want to run by. I'm not forcing my agents to work with any particular system. I just have one that works for me and it's worked for me for the past 10 years. So I advise my agents to use it as well if they don't have an alternative to use. But I always advise that if you're listing a property, run your client's future tenant. There's a lot of fake documents going around out there. There's a lot of people that will talk a good talk and then you get the wrong client into your client's home and you're the one that's going to look bad. So you want to build relationships, you know, from the start. So my advice is always run a tenant that's coming to you. If you're representing the landlord, make sure that you tell, you put it in your listing agreements uh, as far as the MLS goes, where you are the one that's going to be running background evictions and credit reports. So that way you can assure your clients that you have a qualified tenant moving in and that they're not going to have any issues within the first three months of this person moving in where now you got to go through an eviction and all of that nightmare. So that's just my advice. But again, you will rep you will have to discuss that with your clients and see what they feel comfortable with. And again, if you have a credit reporting system that you prefer to use, by all means, my brokerage, I'm free. I'm open to letting you guys use whatever you like. If you need any advice on which one to use, the fee that I charge is $75 and I work with a company called Zumper for that. Okay, if your property is located within an association, you have to find out how much that association fee is. In this case, the house that we're using the example of is a single family home with no association. So the person will not have to have an application fee for an association to get approved in order to move into the property. So in this case, for purposes of my example, it's going to stay blank. But, it per but in cases of yours, which will all vary if your property is residing within an association, make sure that you have collected the information to a contact inside of that association, whether it's an email address, a phone number, a person's name, a form of contact, and make sure that you have acquired the application with the rules and regulations of that community before listing your property on the MLS or even sitting with your client to rent the property out because some, com some communities do not allow rentals. And if your client is unaware of that rule, you need to verify that information. You do not want anybody moving into a community where there's no rentals allowed and then the person's going to call you and asking you hey what happened you know you're at fault for making me move in here without checking the proper rules and regulations of the community the other one that i would like to point out that it's not here is if the community allows pets very important there's a lot of us out there that have pets and we want to move in with our pets but if the community if the landlord allows the pet but the community does not your client, the person that was renting the property, will have to either get rid of their animal or they're going to have to move. You do not want to be caught up in that type of situation. I adore my pet and I do not want to be without her. She's part of the family. So if I moved into a community, I would like to know the rules and regulations. You don't want to waste anybody's time, nor do you want to be caught up in that type of situation. So always verify directly to the association once you get that application what are the rules and regulations, what is allowed and what is not allowed. Most of the times it's in writing and we all know a lot of people don't like to read. Um, so please make sure that you get this stuff clarified in writing. Don't go by what anybody says because people sometimes say things, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they don't understand themselves and they're under some impression and that's not the case. So my advice is if there's an association, go to the horse's mouth. Go directly to the association find out what the rules and regulations are, and then go from there. Besides those, all those points, always talk to your client about how the fees are going to be charged, what fees they want to be, want to be responsible for and which ones they don't. It's all depending on your client on a case-by-case -case basis. We're going to move on. See here where it talks about association approval? You have to understand that if you put a, a deadline here, that has to be abided by. Some associations take... 30 days to approve. Some associations take 
15 days to approve. Some of these days are business days. So these are things that have to be kept in mind if you have someone wanting to move in by the first of the month and it's already the 20th of the month. You know, there's a small gap in that in that time period that I'm talking about where they're not going to be approved in time. So this is important that you want to talk to your client about what are the expectations as to when an application has to be made for a client to be able to move in in time. Then we're going to move on to what are the broker's obligations. So in consideration of the owner's agreement to enter into this agreement, broker agrees to use diligent effort to lease the property, furnish information, to and assist cooperating brokers in negotiating leases, furniture in fur I'm sorry, furnish information to and assist attorneys when needed to draft leases, negotiate leases and renewals of existing leases in according accordance with the rent schedule and terms above. Take reasonable precautions to prevent damage to the property when the property is being shown by the broker or any other broker sales associate and to perform the following activities authorized by broker, check if app applicable. Sorry, got stuck there guys. So these are all the things that you would have to check off that your client is gonna allow you to do. Again, have this conversation with them. Are they going to allow you to display a for rent sign on the property? Use the owner's name in connection with marketing and advertising for the property. Are you going to be using a lockbox to advertise to access the property? Are you going to request credit checks on prospective tenants at the owner's expense? We just covered that. The owner was, in my case, with my brokerage, the owner is that is not an owner expense, that is a tenant expense. So anybody that's coming to apply to this property has to pay an application fee that the owner will not cover. If for whatever reason they don't get approved, that's money that they lose. But that's something you have to be specific with the person who's applying. Broker makes no representation as to the truth or falsity, I could be saying that wrong, of information provided by the prospective tenant or as, the fi or as to the financial integrity or fitness and character of the prospective tenant. So therefore, this also clarifies that that's we're not we're not saying hey this client has a1 credit this client we you know we vouch for this future tenant we're not saying that we're not make as a broker any of the agents and the broker makes that we do not make that type of representation the paperwork that we're drawing up makes the representation and at the end of the day it is the owner's responsibility to make the decision of what he wants to do we are we have a due diligence to present all offers, all documents to the person who owns the property and we analyze it with them. We kind of help them, you know, make the decision, but ultimately it is them the ones that have to make the decision. And the only way that they make that decision is based on the documentation that is presented to them. This is explaining that in very, very, very uh, black and white, pretty much, literally. <laughs> all right, so then we're moving on. Execute leases on behalf of the owner. Owner must execute a special power of attorney authorizing broker to release property on owner's behalf. We are, do not have any special powers of attorneys. And this is something maybe in cases where people are overseas and they have a property manager or someone that they, they, they trust, where they've given them some sort of legal documentation saying that this person has authorization to sign legal documents or to make decisions on their behalf. We don't have anything like that. That's not the case with the example that I'm showing you here. So that's not going to get checked off. Um, compensate any sub agents or cooperating brokers in the transaction, except when not in the owner's best interest. That's definitely one of them. Um, we are going to be compensating brokers or cooperating brokers because that's the reason why we're putting it on the MLS. So definitely you want to click this and I want to go back, uh, on these, on the display property transaction, including for inside a property, you have to check with your, with your, with your clients. Use the owner's name in connection with making advertisement. Again, check with your client. I'm not going to put a check mark next to that for our example. Lockbox systems. If the property is vacant and your client is okay with putting a lockbox in there, you can go ahead and check that. Purpose of this example, I'm leaving it blank because that's something that you need to go through your clients and find out what's going to be the case there. Um, request a credit check on the prospective tenants at owner's expense. We are not going to be checking that off because the owner is not going to be paying for that execute leases on behalf of the owner we're not going to be checking that off either because there's no special of attorney that i know of of any of the clients that i'm representing nor is that a good example for us but i went through that explanation already 
Then we want to move forward. Withhold offers to lease property once owner enters into a binding leasing agreement. Yes, we're not going to continue showing the owner any agreements or any offers that are coming through because we've already executed one. So we've already, we're already involved in a binding. Let's say that that happens, right? We got involved and there was a great offer that came through. It was accepted. There's no reason to keep showing the property or to keep, I mean, if you want to keep showing the property just in case something happens at the association, you can do so. There's nothing that's going to tell you not to do it. I'm just going to advise you as the broker of Pimienta Realty that, you know, at that point you can just stop showing the property and move forward with the binding agreement that you have. That is why we are going to check this off. Moving on, make a final inspection and inventory check at the property at the conclusion of the lease. We will check this off because once the person is moving out, if your client wants to hire you again for, to relist it, to sell to, the, to rent to a new tenant, then you definitely want to make sure that the tenant that was there left the property in good conditions. Any final walkthrough will have to be conducted. Um, complete lease forms as permitted by law. Yep, we will because we are the ones that write out the leases for our clients. So if that's the case, we are authorized to do so under this agreement and under the law, we're allowed to just complete the lease forms. We can write the leases out from scratch. We're not attorneys, but we can just use the form to fill in the blanks. Then we're going to say here, complete and sign a lease base, a lead base, sorry, a lead base paint hazard certification on the owner's behalf for a property built before 1978. Um, we have to sign it. However, they have the seller has to, um, the seller or the owner has to sign as well. So we will complete and we will sign that form that we can find in form simplicity as well. And that is a whole separate, um, documentation with a whole separate transaction when we're getting ready to write a lease. Um, as far as this uh, example goes, we will be we will have to do it. So we will have to check this off. If there's any other addendums or any other stipulations that you and your client have agreed to, you would click other and then see addendum. In this case, we're just going to keep it simple and we're going to move on. Advertising broker. Broker agrees to use due diligent effort to advertise the property as broker deems advisable, including advertising the property on the internet unless limited in. And it talks about the limitations in the next two boxes below. Um, if the owner opts out of these two, then most likely there's no reason to put it on the MLS because it's just no way of advertising it. So we are going to read. I barely ever use these two, but I want to just read it for purposes of you guys knowing. Display the property on the internet except the street address of the property. Shall not be displayed on the internet. Owner does not authorize broker to display the property on the internet. Owner understands and acknowledges that if the owner selects option two, consumers who conduct searches for listings on the internet will not see the information about the listed property in response to their search. So on these two, it's up to what you have agreed with the owner. Again, that was very clear. I read what it said, black and white. Up to you what you guys are going to decide uh, with the client. It does kind of doesn't allow you to do the marketing that you need to do. So how you're going to get the property rented, it's a big, it's going to be a big challenge. Not impossible, but it'll be a challenge. So I never really use these. I always leave them blank. I've never had anyone say anything to me about it. But again, this is up to you and your client. If that's the case, make sure that there's an initials here and here. So you will initial one side, owners will initial another side. Then we're going to go to B. Virtual office websites. Some real estate brokerages offer real estate brokerage services online. These websites are referred to as virtual office websites, VOW. An automated estimate of market value or reviews and comments about a property may be displayed in conjunction with a property of some VOWs. Anyone who's registered on a virtual office website may gain access to such automated valuations or comments and reviews about any property displayed on a VOW, unless limited below, a VOW may display automated valuate, sorry, valuations or comments, reviews, blogs about this property. Again, this is something you're going to have to talk to with your client, see what they're okay with. Owner does not authorize an automated estimate of the market value of the listing or hyperlink to such estimate to be displayed in immediate conjunction with the listing of this property. Owner does not authorize third parties to write comments or reviews about the listing of the property or display hyperlinks to such comments or reviews in the immediate conjunction with the listing of this property. Again, these are things you're going to have to discuss with your client. That's something, I mean, 
Again, I've never done anything about that. I never checked anything off. So it's never been in my experience in all the years that I've been doing real estate. These two boxes here have always stayed as is. I've never, ever had to check anything off. But everyone is going to have a different client. Owner's obligation. In consideration of the obligations of the broker, owner agrees to cooperate with broker in carrying out the purpose of this agreement, including providing broker with all the documents needed by prospective tenant to seek association board approval. There's no explanation needed there, guys. I already went over that when I talked about getting the application to the association. Um, to refer immediately to broker all inquiries regarding the leasing of the property. To make property available, available for broker access during reasonable times and furnish broker with the following keys. Specific number for purposes of showing and delivering the property unit. Now, guys, this is important. This is important. Again, you're going to have to talk to your clients. What are the keys that are required for the property? Are there unit keys? Of course there is. Are there building access keys? We don't know. It depends if it's in a community. Mailbox keys. Pool keys, garage doors and openers, and any other keys that may be available, maybe shed keys, maybe keys that open up three and four locks throughout the house, storage keys. A array of things can come up on this um, section of the agreement. However, this is up to you to discuss with your client and make sure you fill this stuff out because this stuff is important. The client may not be here. The client may be trusting you to show the property at all times if the property is vacant. You're going to be responsible for these keys if you have access to the keys. You want to make sure that they're written down. You do not want this client to come back and say, hey, you lost a garage opener now because of you. The tenant has to pay $50 and the tenant doesn't want to pay for it. And now I have to pay for it. And, you know, I gave it to you. You want to make sure we keep those gray areas as black and white as possible. And the only way of doing that is by having it all in writing in an agreement. And it's right here. I would make sure that you have this stuff filled out correctly. Moving on. To notify broker in the event owner or tenant terminates a lease on the property prior to the lease expiration date. To inform broker before conveying the property that, then we're moving on to F, that the lockbox if utilized will be for the benefit of the owner and to release those working buyer through broker and broker's local board of realtors from all liability and responsibility in connection with any loss that may occur. Not restrict the rental to the property according to race, color, religion, sex, handicap, familial, familial status, national origin, or any other classes protected by the state or, lo or local law. And not to ask or expect broker to impose such restrictions on rentals of the property. Guys, that's super, super important. You know, we have clients that may want us to be biased or may want us to be discriminatory because they don't find their comments or their views to be discriminatory. Well, here at Pimenta Realty, we love everyone and we want everyone to have a fair opportunity in being able to rent a property. We don't discriminate. So if you have a client that's kind of, you know, going towards a discriminatory action, I would advise them and remind them that they signed this piece of document and under G of the document, they signed and they agreed to, just like you did, that there will be no restriction of the property based on any of these classes that we're talking about here, any of these other topics that we hear, we see here. So it's super important that, you know, we keep people as fair as possible. I personally don't like when there's discrimination and um, I hope that the, whoever's watching this video doesn't either. Uh, but again, we're dealing with people and this is he the way humans are behaving and, you know, we hope that everyone is fair and non-biased as we are here with Pimienta Realty, but, you know, the world is the world. So always remind your clients if they start with any racist comments or ideologies that they may have, just remind them of what they signed or what they're about to sign. And if they have a problem with that, then guys, you know what, they're going to, you're going to have, this is not the client for you. Just my opinion. Moving on, to provide a written approval or denial of any application who is a service member as defined in FS 250.01 within seven days after the receipt of rental application. If denied, owner will provide a reason of denial. Again, this is all stuff black and white. To provide, then we're moving on, to provide complete and accurate information to broker, including disclosing all known facts that materially affect the value of the property. See addendum blank entitled blank. If the property was built in 1977 or earlier, owner will provide broker with, broker with all information. Owner knows about lead-based paint and lead-based paint hazards in the property 
and will and with all available documents pertaining to such paint and hazards as required by federal law. Owner understands that the law requires the provision of this information to broker and to prospective tenants before the tenants become obligated to lease the property. Owner acknowledges that broker will rely on owner's representation regarding the property when dealing with prospective tenants. Owner will immediately inform broker of any material facts that arise after signing this contract. Super important, guys. We want to make sure that properties that are built before 1977 have that lead-based paint addendum disclosure attached to the lease agreement. Reason being is that you don't want anybody coming back to you and saying, hey, you rented a property that had lead-based paint in it. Now, because of you, my child is sick or I'm sick, and now I have to go through all these series of medical um, situations. Like You do not want that to happen, so you want to make sure that the owner provides these this information to you and that you have it all again in writing so that's only for properties that were built before 1977 in the case of my example this house was built before 1977 so this one when we we were going to be writing a lease we would need that addendum attached to our lease agreement in this event we're not working on leases right now we're just working on listing agreements and this doesn't apply to us right now but just keep that in mind for when you do j to identify and hold harmless broker and broker's office directors, agents, and employees from all claim demands, causes of action, costs of in and expenses, including reasonable attorney fees at all levels, and from liability to any person to extend based on owner's misstatement, negligence, action, inactions, or failure to perform the obligations of this contract or any lease or agreement with a vendor or existence of undisclosed material facts about the property. This subparagraph will survive broker's performance and transfer of title. That can be any more black and white. We're basically not liable for anything that the owner has not told us or has been neglectful in telling us. So we're just not liable. That's just a little disclosure. You want to maybe explain that to the, to the person, your client, that, yeah, if, you're, if there's something wrong with this property and you're not telling me and something arises afterwards, I'm not liable and you're signing that. So please point that out to them. K, to reasonably inspect the property before allowing the tenant to take possession and to make the repairs necessary to transfer a reasonably safe dwelling unit to the tenant. This all goes through the walkthrough. You know, when you're there, if you see that there is a broken window and there is glass poking out of it. You know, talk to your client and tell them that they have to fix that before someone moves in. Because if that happens and someone this, you know, gets hurt as a result of it, that's something that they may come back and say, hey, but what happened here? So the, the your client is responsible for making the property safe. And that's what Kay is pretty much saying. Um, to perform any independent investigations to determine whether the local municipality where the property is located adopted an ordinance that prohibits property owners from renting to sexual offenders, predators, for information regarding these types of ordinances in your county, search county records and or log on to www.municicode.com. Owner acknowledges that it is the owner's responsibility to research the local ordinances to determine whether or not such ordinances exist and to determine whether a tenant is suitable for rental if such ordinances exist. Owners understand that this is not a warranty of any kind and is not intended to be a substitute for any independent investigation owner may wish to make. You know, guys, again, that goes back to the background searches that I always advise you do to a tenant coming into, a cli into your client's home as part of the service. You want to make sure that their backgrounds are being ran, that there are none of these sexual predators going into rent of one of your client's homes. And if your client is okay with having a sexual predator or somebody on the sex offenders list renting their property, then you need to make sure that they understand what the code is of that city. It is their responsibility at the end of the day. All you're doing is assisting with the process, but it is their responsibility to know what that code is. And there may be some codes, some county codes that don't allow sex offenders to live in a certain neighborhood. I don't know of any. This has never happened to me. I have never come across this type of situation in the 20 years I've been in real estate. However, that does not mean that it's not it does not exist. And this document right here clears you from that type of responsibility. But it's always very good for you to remind your client that this is what this says. Because again, this is a binding contract. 
you're signing it, I'm signing it, your client is signing it, and we all have to understand that there's a legal obligation that we have to uphold these contracts in their true format of black and white. Now we're going to go on to the best part, compensation. Owner agrees to compensate broker as follows, including paying any applicable taxes on broker services if owner enters into a lease of the property with a tenant during the leasing period, regardless of whether the tenant fulfills the terms of the lease or, it, or if during the listing period broker pro procures a tenant. <laughs> procures, procures a tenant who is ready, willing, and able to lease the property under this terms of the agreement or terms acceptable to the owner. Again, these are conversations that you need to have with your clients. So whatever the amount of the compensation that the owner agrees to pay the broker, you're going to put him right here. So let's talk about what are the different ones. So we're going to say blank percent of the rent due each rental period, blank percentage of the gross value of the lease amount, blank percent of the first month's rents or other whatever other agreement you guys have come up with. I always do one of these two. It's either going to be blank 50% of the first month's rent. I'm sorry, blank 100% of the first month's rent because you're going to have to, the norm, this is the norm that's out there. This is the common um, charges that are out there. It all varies from owner to owner. Everyone, again, talk to your client and see what they're comfortable paying. However, my experience has always been they pay one month. One month of whatever the rent is, if the rent's going to be $2,500, in this case, we're going to have to click here, and we're going to put 100% of the first month's rent, meaning that we that being in the realty is going to keep $2,500. Now, out of those $2,500, you may have to split that with another agent. At that point, then it's going to become half and half. It's not going to be just $2,500, but that's not up to the owner to decide how it gets distributed. That is up to us as the brokers usually we do 50 percent you know for bringing the client and, and so forth um in this case so it's going to be this one if you chose blank percent of the gross value of the lease it's very simple if you chose to say we're going to do 10 percent, which i've seen i've seen some leases out there that say they're going to do 10 percent. so we would click this and we would put 10 percent of the gross lease what you would do is that you would have to add up all the months all 12 months you're going to get a number and then out of that number, you're going to take 10% of that. And then usually you split that 50-50 with another agent. But that's up to you and up to your client what you guys decide. Um, if you chose this one, blank percent of the rent due each rental period, then it would be whatever amount you choose. And each rental period is 12 months, one month, whatever you guys agree to. I believe this is representing 12 months. So again, if you want to put here, you know, 10% of the rental period, let's say the rental period is six months, right? Let's just say that you're doing a six month lease and your client agrees to pay 10% of that. That's what you would put here. But in this case, the most common one that we use, it will be this one or this one. I chose this one. That's the one that I've mostly seen. But again, this is a conversation you will have with your client and they will decide. Um, we're going on to be time and manner of payment. Broker will deduct this fee from the rent collected by broker after said rent becomes due and owning to the owner. If said rent is insufficient to cover broker's fee, owner will remit the balance within blank calendar days after on, on which rent becomes due. So I like to put here seven days. There's no reason why somebody's going to take more than seven days to give you your money as far as part of you doing your job. You brought a recurring client to your client's home. They rented it. There was a walkthrough and all the monies were exchanged. There's no reason why the client cannot give you your money within seven days. Even if they're waiting for checks to clear, this, that, the third. It's never happened to me, but that just feel like that's what the norm is. And here at Bimita Realty, that's what I want to see in your contract. Seven calendar days. But we got to pick one of these. So we're going to read on and then we're going to pick the best one. And I'm going to tell you which one I prefer in my contracts. So owner will pay broker's fee within seven calendar days after entering into a lease for a property. Owner will pay broker's fee within seven calendar days from the date on which the rent payment is due from tenant. And you know, then we click um, other specific if you came to other terms with it. I like to pick this one 
broker will deduct this fee from rents collected by broker after rent said becomes due and owing to the owner if said rent is insufficient to cover broker's fee owner will remit the balance within seven calendar days yada 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 we went through this already um we like to collect our fee when the person is moving in so we're going to deduct it from the rent collected when we collect the rent the day of walkthrough we collect the three months most cases there's already a deposit in place so you're really collecting two more months so if there's a call if there is a a deposit collected at that point i mean this is me talking if you're representing you know the the tenant and you're coming into the owner it's you know it depends on the situation in this situation we're just doing the listing agreement so we're going to tell the set the, the, the your client that the day the client move that the other tenant moves in you're going to get your money from that those deposits not the deposits but from those monies that are coming in and you're going to be deducting it from the first month's rent and that's what this says and if for whatever reason that tenant didn't bring the complete money that they have walked through and the owner was so kind to let them move in the owner is going to owe you that rest of that balance within seven calendar days and that's what we agreed to we're gonna move on new leases and renewals if owner enters into any new lease or renewal of the original lease with a tenant placed in the property or by or through broker owner agrees to pay broker a compensation in connection with the new lease or renewals in the amount specified in paragraph 6a um you know this is really up to you um this there can be renewals some tenants some owners don't want to do renewals um in this case is already here so i would specify this with them see if they're okay with it because it clearly says here if you enter into a new lease or renewals of any original lease the tenant in place the property by the broker you know property by through a broker owner agrees to pay a broker compensation in connection with the new lease that's already here you may want to follow up with your client whenever the leases are up for renewals or whenever the lease you know whenever the lease is up and there's going to be a new client being brought in or the you know the sell the ten the landlord wants to re-rent their property they may want to go through you but in any event if there is any renewals it's all here they should owe you a commission Moving on, protection period, owner agrees to pay a broker's fee within blank days after the listing period, after the end of the listing period. Owner leases the property to any prospects whom the broker or any other broker communicated during the listing period regarding leasing the property. If requested, broker must provide owner with a list of said prospects and entitlement to compensation under this subparagraph will be limited to the names on that list. The protection period ceases if owner enters into a good faith exclusive right to lease contract with another broker after the listing period ends. So after our six months ends, I like to put here 30 days. And I expect you guys to also do the same if you're writing a lease agreement under my brokerage. Reason being that I like to put 30 days is because you never know. So you have a you have a listing, you listed it for six months, you did everything you could, you did open houses, you aggressively advertised it, you did everything you had to do for this property, but nothing happens, it doesn't get listed, it doesn't get rented, sorry, it gets listed, but it doesn't get rented is what I mean. And then, you know, the owner's like, listen, you know what, it's not working out, I don't feel like you're bringing me any movement to my listing, yada, 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 I want to cancel, great, go ahead. But within those six months, you showed the property to xyz tenant xyz tenant sees that it's off the market there's no longer a realtor involved now he goes and he goes you know and reaches out to this you know xyz landlord some reason somehow they communicate they get each other's phone number at some point and they cut you out of the deal well guess what you still brought that client to the table you still showed that client that property and it was, you know, for whatever reason, it just didn't work out where it didn't get rented through you. But that doesn't mean that they don't want your commission. So that's why I like to put 30 days. So if you find out and you have proof that you showed this person that property on such and such date and after the listing expired or you can't or the, set, the owner canceled the agreement, that same tenant that you took your time to show ends up renting it. You're entitled to your commission and you have 30 days, they have 30 days to come, you know, to come in good standing with that. The owner does. If he doesn't come with that, then, you know, then there's lawsuits and all of that other stuff that comes from that. But what he's signing at the beginning of our leasing agreement 
it is that he will give you your money within 30 days and that is what is here and that is what I put here. So you want to let the you let your client know that there is some type of protection period. I've never experienced anything like that in my entire 20 years in being real estate, but there are shady people in the world, so we got to keep it in writing. How th now this is what makes your property go up on the MLS or not. So Cooperation and compensation with other brokers. Broker's office policy is to cooperate with all brokers except when not in the owner's best interest and to offer compensation in the amount of blank percent of the gross lease amount. Remember, we went back to that other paragraph that we talked about this. Now we're going to talk about how you're going to split your commission with another agent. So it all depends what you and your client agree to is how we're going to put it down here. Then we're going to say blank percent of the first month's rent or blank to the tenant's agents who represent the interest of the tenant and not the interest of the owner in a transaction. And to offer compensation the amount of blank percentage of the gross lease value of the lease, blank percent of the first. Oh, I read that already. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I read that already. All right. So we're going to go here. A blank percent of the gross lease, lease amount lease of the lease yeah so blank percent of compensation in the amount of blank percent of the gross lease of the value blank percent of the first month's rent or flat fee to the transactions broker for the tenant none of the above if this is checked the property cannot be placed on the mls all right so i got a little confused here as i was reading because these little lines are so close together but anyways we'll go back i'm just gonna tell you which one i like to pick so the one that i usually pick is um it's going to be a transaction broker so we're transaction brokers we are going to represent that transaction we don't represent anybody exclusively we're not single agents we don't that all opens up cans of lawsuits we want to keep everything transaction brokers we are here to represent the transaction so in that case we have to pick the one that comes closest to this, which I believe is this one. So it's going to be and or to offer compensation in the amount of blank of the gross lease value. We went through this already. I like to do the first month's rent blank of the first month's rent. So I like to put 50% here. And if you guys are working on a contract, I would advise you to do the same um, to the transaction broker because we don't do a flat fee. So there will be no flat fee unless you have agreed to your with your client to do a flat fee. If you've agreed to your with your client to do, let's say, $1,000 for the fluffy, that's what you would put there. Um, again, it has to be under the line of transaction brokers for the tenant. That's it. We don't pick anything else. We only pick every anything that has to do with transaction brokers for the tenant. And, in, and then here you pick, whether it's the gross value of the lease, whether it's the first month's rent, whatever you choose, that's where you're going to put it. It's always going to be for transaction. Okay? Um, moving on early termination. If the owner decides to not lease the property and broker deems owner reasonable, I'm sorry, reason acceptable owner may conditionally terminate this agreement by signing a withdrawal agreement and simultaneously paying a cancellation fee of blank plus applicable sales tax. However, owner agrees that if the property is contracted for lease to a tenant during the time period from conditional termination to the end of the listing and protection periods, broker may void early termination and owner will be obligated to pay the compensation set forth in paragraph 6A, less the cancellation fee. We went over that already. That's what we went over previously when we talked about a client, you know, leasing a property that was in the market for lease while you were what you guys were under contract and then the listing expired or the cancellation happened and then the tenant came back and rented directly from the owner so you're still you're still going to get compensated you should be getting compensated so if you choose to charge your client an early termination fee because that means that the period where you have agreed to list the property those six months they wanted to cancel on month three and you want to charge them five thousand dollars you're more than welcome to put that there i always put and I'll tell you why, I don't care. If a client wants to take their business elsewhere, you're more than welcome to. I've had these types of discussions with other people and people are like, no, I put $1,000 on there because I want to type my client in, blah, blah, blah. I'm not that type of broker. 
I'm not that type of sales agent either. I really don't care. If you don't like the way that my services are working and you want to take it from me to give to someone else, you're more than welcome to do so and you don't have to pay me anything because I don't want to feel anyone wants to work with me because they have to because they don't want to pay any brokerage cancellation fee. I want people to work with me because they like me, because they like how I work, because they value me, because they trust me. And so by me putting here a cancellation fee, make might make them feel obligated to something that they are not comfortable with and therefore they may not sign this and I may not get the listing or they may not you know they may stick to me not because they like my work but because they feel obligated to because they don't want to pay a cancellation fee and then they won't come back to me because they don't like the way I work so I personally put zero on there I really don't care if you want to work with me great wonderful I'm happy I'm very excited I'll do everything I can to make you my best client but if you don't want to work with me then goodbye I'm not gonna hate. I'm not gonna hate on anybody's game. So that's how I approach that fact, that section of the contract. And then here we're gonna go to dispute and resolutions. This agreement it will be construed under Florida law. All disputes between broker and owner based on this agreement or its breach will be mediated under the rules of the American Arbitration Association or other mediator agreed upon by the parties. Mediation is a process in which parties attempt to resolve and dispute. By submitting it to an imperial mediator who facilitates the resolution of the dispute, but who is empowered to impose a settlement on the parties. The parties will equally divide the mediation fee in any, if any, in any litigation based on this agreement. The prevailing party will be entitled to recover reasonable attorney fees and costs at all levels, unless the parties agreed that disputes will be settled by arbitration as follows. Arbitration by initialing the space above provided, then we all have to sign this owner, owner, bro listing associate, and listing broker agrees that dispute not resolved by mediation will be settled by neutral, by neutral binding arbitration in the county in which the property is located in accordance with rules of the American Arbitration Association or, or other arbitur, arbitur, arbitrator, sorry, or <laughs> arbitrator agreed upon the parties. Each party to any arbitration or litigation to enforce the arbitration provi provision of this agreement or any arbitration award will pay its own fees, costs, and expenses, including attorney fees at all levels, and will equally split the arbitrator's fees and administrative fees of arbitration. In a nutshell, what this means is if anybody got sued, they agreed to do some sort of mediation before going to arbitration. And this is something that you might want to explain to your client. Not might you want to explain this to your client. I've never experienced any of this. Thank the Lord. I've never had to go through any litigation. Anybody got sued. Thank God. I've always been very ethical and, you know, and try to resolve things if, there any, if anything ever arose before any legal action needed to be taken. So I would just tell them if there's anything that happens and we need to go to court, just read them this paragraph and explain to them how it would work. They're agreeing to start off with mediation and if it doesn't get resolved in mediation, then it has to go to arbitration. But, you know, they have to understand the fees that each party will be entitled to be responsible for, in other words. So. Moving on, we talked about this as well. Number 10, very important, brokerage relationship. Owner authorizes broker to act as... We are transaction brokers. We are never going to be single agents. We are never single agents um, with the cons cons consent to transition to transaction broker. That's too complicated. And we, we're never going to be non-representative of the owner. We do represent the transaction. So there's, I, you guys have a license. You guys learned this in, your, in real estate school. I'm not going to go one by one of what each means. All I want you to know is that at Pimienta Realty, we're transaction brokers. Every single piece of document that we will be signing with clients will be transactional brokers. We want to be responsible for the transaction. We're going to oversee the transaction and make sure everybody gets the, what they need to be uh, to be fair. We're not going to be single agents or represent anybody exclusively unless that's something that your client has to have. You know, then just come speak to me about it. I'll consult with our attorney and, you know, we can go from there. But as of right now, we only do transaction broker. So please check transaction broker. 11, this agreement is binding on brokers and brokers, heirs, personal representative, administration, administrators, successors, or assigns. This agreement is to, and to, uh, I got stuck. Sorry, guys. This agreement is the entire agreement between broker and owner. No prior or present agreements or representations shall be binding on broker or owner unless included in this agreement. Signatures, initials, documents referenced 
In this agreement, counterparts and modifications communicated electronically or on paper will be acceptable for all purposes and will be binding. So you already know, everything that is signed here is absolutely binding between broker, owner, and sales associate. We all have to sign, you see? We all have to sign. If there's any additional clauses that you want to incur here, some people put here, um, you know, transaction fees or rental fees. There's all kinds of stuff that people can put here. But in my case, in our brokerage, we don't have to worry about that. I don't, we don't charge anything additional when it comes to rentals. When it comes to sales, we do, but that's a whole nother topic. For purposes of this listing agreement for rental, this stays blank. Then we're going to move down. We're going to all initially, there's a signature that goes somewhere here. There should be a signature. It is. We're going to sign here. It says owner, the oh, not us. The owner is going to sign. You don't have to do a tax ID uh, and then authorized associate, associate or broker will sign here. So this is where your signature would go. And of course the date. Um, I never do this, but if you want to, you can always say, say email because we usually do a form simplicity e-sign um, where the client goes ahead and signs it. So um, that's it guys. That's all I, that it takes to do an exclusive right to lease listing agreement. Um, so I will conclude the video now. If you have any questions, you know how to find me. If you are not an agent of Pimienta Realty, I would love to have you on board. Um, and you can always give me a call at 305-303-7399. And you can always email me, pimientarealty at gmail.com or leave a comment below and I will get back with you and um, give you more information to the firm. So that's all for now. Thank you so much for watching. Have a great day. Bye.